Sarah, tell us, how can we create more inclusive startups? Well, I love the question, um, mostly because there's a real reason to, right? They outperform those that are not by as much as I think it was 32% or something. They make better business decisions 87% of the time. And I think it was 70% more likely to capture new markets. But if you read the McKinsey report that came out, women of color, for example, only make up 4% of the computing workforce and very little senior uh, roles. So obviously I'm a woman in tech, um, no woman of color in tech. Um, and I can share with you, you know, my uh, recent story when um, my co-founders and I decided we would look to raise so that we could accelerate. I told people in my network and I'm lucky I have a great network, right? So lots of congratulations, lots of support, but there was this onslaught of horror stories, how it's impossible, you know, oh, it took this woman two years, all oh, the women get any barely investment dollars. And um, I went on to have this meeting with this investor, not to actually pitch him, but for deck feedback, which is, you know, every founder's journey, death by a thousand cuts is the deck, right? Um, and he didn't address me by name at all <laughs> in the whole meeting, uh, not even the question to do with AI or the algorithm, which is what I actually created. He uh, like asked all the questions to my uh, counterparts. And so, you know, that highlights a few of the issues. So I'll just touch on a few, you know, firstly, the power of stories, like how many wouldn't be put off by this onslaught of negativity that they hear around it. Um, not that we need to mask reality. We absolutely don't. It's pure fact that it's challenging, but we also need to focus on what's possible and, and give people very clear actionable steps if they want to take action rather than get them stuck in, in, in the, in the um, challenging process, right? Second of all, I'll be frank, look, there was nothing to su like suggest that he was doing this on purpose. For all intents, he was a very nice man. Um, it was clearly a very unconscious bias and we all have them, right? But um, leaders, investors, everyone in the tech ecosystem needs to understand their own and how that impacts their choices. So for example, if your team doesn't have representation of your audience that you're serving, then your products and choices are unlikely to serve them well, right? You need to make a conscious effort to challenge your thoughts and make sure you include representation at each stage of creation. Um, thirdly, you know, the journey of the entrepreneur is this emotional roller coaster. Like it's an hourly basis. You have this meeting and you're like, oh, this is amazing. An hour later, you have a meeting and you're like, why am I doing this? And, you know, given what I do for a living, we see a lot of data on human behavior. And there's definitely this blueprint for, for those that are more successful. But we don't teach any of that stuff normally. You know, we don't teach things like resiliency, self-worth, values, the things that actually get you through the journey of what it takes to be an entrepreneur. So we need to equip people with those skills just as we do all these other things that we teach. Um, I would also say, and this is my opinion, but we need to question our, our mental model about progress and success, right? So yes, we've made progress, right? Women can wear trousers now, but when you peel back the layers um, and you look at the gender gap, it took us 47 years to gain 26 point, whatever it was, four cents, right? On, on the dollar. So. We also have a mental health gap with women two times as likely to suffer from anxiety and depression. So there's lots of conversations and it's very easy to think we're making more progress than we actually are. And conversations are important. They need to happen, right? But we also need to take meaningful actions. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard as to, to what we think success is for, like what are we aiming for? And you know, goals and objectives tend to drive behaviors. So all of us have to ask ourselves, do we even have the right ones in place to drive the right behaviours? And obviously, I cannot answer that question without saying that the pure fact, we do not have as many diverse candidates <laughs> to begin with in the funnel, right? So we definitely need to focus on the funnel. Um, I get asked to talk to a lot of younger women, especially those considering engineering, and it absolutely kills me when they go, I really love it, but it looks really hard for a woman to be successful, right? We need to not lose the, those that are really passionate about these dis disciplines so early on, you know, just because it is fact harder to find them, it shouldn't stop you from having a diverse slate of potential candidates because, because it matters that they're there in your slate of candidates to begin with. And, you know, I can go on for a while about this, so I'll just end with this. As, as, as everybody here, it, you know, we're people in the tech ecosystem. We have a real opportunity to, to play a role in creating more inclusive startups. So if you're a startup founder, you have the opportunity to actually create a company culture from the start, from the ground up that's inclusive, right? If you're an investor, you have the opportunity to seek and help build diverse teams. And if you're a diverse individual with a great idea, you have a chance of being one of the success stories. So 
you know, I always say to people, look, if you've got an idea and you've dreamed of doing it, just focus on one step forward or even go and talk to someone. You know, I, I did not have future worlds when I was at uni. <laughs> I had jesters, but not <laughs> but not future worlds. Um, and, you know, you have resources. So the journey might not be easy, no, no, but, you know, you stand firm in your ideas, what you believe in, and you learn and you pivot as you go. Because at the end of the day, you know, we all have to ask ourselves, are our own behaviors contributing to the problem or, or to the, the solution, right? Because it's about awareness and action. I'll probably Sarah, pause there because I've just given you a whole torrent of my, yeah, my viewpoint. Yeah, Sarah, <laughs> in just a few small minutes, you've given us, I think, what, five kind of real headlines of, of things that, that can be done, things that can make a difference. So what I want to do, everyone, please do use your devices, ask any questions of Sarah, and I'm going to be getting to them. But I'm going to take the first few questions and just try and drill into a few of those points uh, to get started. Um, and the first one, you alluded to this story that was where well, you, you mentioned really briefly, you kind of gave us a little um, a glimpse into a pretty shocking story. Do you want to just tell us a bit more about that, how that played out, what difference that made to you? Well, you know, it was an interesting experience for me because honestly, everyone out here is, is so supportive that I've, I've been fortunate enough to meet, but they, everyone's told me about this species of um, investor, but it was my first encounter with them, right? And it was a really bizarre experience to not be spoken to or referred to, not even once. Um, and have everything directed to, to my male co-founders. Um, but until the very end, when with a very condescending tone, he was like, now I don't want you to worry about what I've said today. And I was like, and I don't want you to worry about me worrying because I don't tend to do that. Like I'm gonna give my energy to the actions um, and I'm not gonna waste my energy in like ruminating, right? Um, but like I said, there was nothing to indicate it was on purpose. And it was very unconscious. So as a, a, a human enthusiast, uh, when it comes to behavior, right, um, it was very fascinating to me. Um, now, personally, it didn't deter me. I mean, I believe in my mission. I know who I am. It didn't put me off. Um, and I know not all money is equal, right? So I'll talk to 200 people if I have to, to get to the right money. But you can imagine how someone might feel after that, because you know, I think Deloitte's uh, inclusion report showed that it was around 60% of people, whether it's gender, age, race, ethnicity, sexuality, disability, um, had bias in their workplace. You can imagine how after instances like this, that people aren't even doing intentionally, people may feel, right? So this unconscious bias, these deep rooted beliefs that show up in our actions without realizing um, can actually be quite detrimental to a lot of people. You know, um, every, Probably every woman I know out here has their coffee story. I have mine. You know, I was at the exec briefing center there to there to present. And this lovely CEO, really charming guy, he walked in and he was like, I'll take a coffee when you get a chance, dear. And I was like, that's fine. I'll make you a coffee, you know. But but the reality is it's these unconscious biases that are playing out. In fact, nearly half of um, African-American and Latina women have been mistaken for administrative or custodial staff. And what they found is these types of situations end up having big impact, right? People end up feeling alienated. They withhold ideas and it can fuel things like um, imposter syndrome. And I can absolutely see from my perspective as an old white guy. So I'm one of the group that's massively overrepresented how the first time I was presenting to a board, I was really nervous. That was the first time I'd been in that room, in that environment, talking to the executives in my, in my business. If at that point, someone had asked me to make the coffee or, or do some other menial task, potentially I'm already nervous and then suddenly I'm deflated and then potentially my presentation doesn't go as well. Potentially that's career limiting because I've just not got off onto a good start. So the, the whole kind of delta of that impact, I can completely see how that could play out. But of course, maybe completely oblivious to the person on the other end, not intentional, as you say, it's sometimes we look for the villains, but, but perhaps it's the people that are absolutely meaning well, but but getting yeah. it completely wrong. Look, you said we're not doing well enough on equipping potential startups, uh, startup founders with key skills like resilience. And, you know, that's really challenging for us. We help potential startup founders and we don't focus on resilience. So tell me what's the problem and what can we do about it? So, you know, here's the thing, obviously like at Mevolution, that's what we do, right? When we found that everybody suffers from these things that we call internal blockers, they drain us, they work against us showing up at full capacity. And if you take my story from the very start, there were so many potential drop-off points, right? When you hear all the bad stories, you might just be like, why am I bothering? Oh my gosh, this is impossible, I'll give up, right? 
um, when you interact with the delights of the investor that I told you, right, they could have blamed themselves or spent ages ruminating about what was said or one, wondering if they were worth it, if they could do it. Um, the thing is, everyone has these internal blockers, but women and minorities tend to suffer from them more. And so I always say to people, we teach these skills, you know, we teach budding entrepreneurs how to create pitch decks. And that's great. We need that. We absolutely do need that. There is an art to pitching. But we also need to specifically teach the things like cognitive flexibility and mental strength for the journey ahead. So if you have programming around equipping people with the skills, there needs to be dedicated programming for them as the human. Because at the end of the day, like Ben, Ben can't be the best X unless Ben is the best that Ben can be. Right. So you need to help them with their mental fortitude and things that are needed for the journey, because it is like this on an hourly basis. And you need to be able to get through that without losing yourself and without without you know losing what's important to you around you family relationships things like that yeah that's that is really challenging certainly for me personally and certainly something i'm keen to follow up offline uh, in a different context but very keen to follow up on what we can do in future worlds you mentioned internal blockers um what do you see as some of the the top kind of internal blockers that you come across so i could talk to blockers all day but i'll narrow it down right? <laughs> not on the ones that we see uh, specific gender differences so uh, rumination, so that's the repetitive thoughts. Actually, the vast majority suffer from it to a degree, um, but when it happens, it happens more for women and when it happens, it's stronger. The impact is stronger, it lasts longer and it takes them down uh, harder, like for that moment where they're ruminating. Another area is um, self-care. So women are more likely to drop self-care activities to meet the demands of work and family, as well as inner voice. Again, a lot of people actually suffer from it to a degree but it's more prevailing in women and minorities and it hits them harsher. The words they actually use for themselves are much harsher. And in fact, I think it was a study that showed 22% uh, um, women are more likely than men to, to report imposter syndrome in tech and STEM professions specifically. So, you know, at the end of the day, human behavior is a critical aspect if you want to include, uh, like have increased inclusion. Um, it's also very critical for something called psychological safety, which I'm sure if you're looking at inclusion, you've heard a lot about. It's all a buzz, right? But when you look at what it takes to create psychological safety, yes, you need policies and regulations, but it's, all, it's a human thing, right? There's all these trainings we have to do. I know every time I am board somewhere, they sit me through these trainings and we all click and we all click. But the reality is, is it takes human behavior to create a space where people feel they can be really open perspectives are taken into account and um, responses are had rather than reactions, right? So the person speaking needs to be able to be confident and feel safe. And the person listening has to create that feeling of safety because they're not reactive, because they understand where their unconscious bias is. So it's like, we do all these things, right? And it's like diversity and inclusion becomes this checkbox rather than something we're fostering um, we, in our community. So we want to, to, to be successful in it, then we have to think about the behaviors needed as well as the supporting infrastructure and mechanisms. It's really challenging. And I've heard it be said before, things like this sort of generic uh, inclusion training or uncle <laughs> yeah. training. That, They're working so well. <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely, it can, it can achieve almost the reverse effect that people think that they've had the training, therefore they've got that squared away and they don't have to worry about it. And actually almost it can make it worse. And you highlight that point about diversity being treated as a, a checkbox exercise. One of the things I often hear from VCs that I speak to uh, that aren't funding many women is they say, well, not many women are applying, not many people are pitching to us. Uh, we see it in future worlds that, you know, how many women are coming forward with a startup idea that we can back, we'd love to back more. Um, but I was doing an event with Karen Catlin uh, and she really challenged me strongly on the, the, the pipeline excuse is just a really flim flimsy excuse. You know, uh, what can we do if we have got a skewed pipeline? What can we do if we're one of those people who, who thinks oh, there's just not the people coming through? It's not my fault. It's someone else's fault. What, what can we do about that? Yeah, I mean, look, I have to look. It's fact that the pipeline's not great. Right. But life is about understanding what what arena we're playing in and then figure it out what's possible. Right. So we can't get stuck there. We have to look at what's possible. So that's not to say it might not take you a little bit more effort, but I'll share with you a Harvard study. They found that if you had one woman in a finalist candidate of four, she had 0% chance of being hired. But if you added one more woman or minority candidate, the decision makers actually considered them. So it makes a big difference to put them in your slate to begin with. That's not saying, now I'm not saying hire someone just because they are, 
that's when it gets all detrimental, right? It's find them and put them in your slate and give them a fair chance. And I will share with you, I think I read it was um, in the five months following George Floyd's death in May, 2020, there was an over 200% increase in the hiring of black directors by the Russell 3000. So clearly they found them somewhere, right? <laughs> so it might be harder but we need to put the effort in. And like I said, do we have the right goals? But then not only do we need to put the effort in for the funnel at the beginning, we need to put the effort in throughout because many studies, um, one from McKinsey showed that you know, the massive drop off between entry level women and then first level managers. And then if you look at CEO and senior leadership, it's something like just over 10% or something. So yes, early in the funnel is important, but then when they're in the funnel, like how do we grow support and develop diverse talent so that we don't have this vast drop off Sarah, thank you. That is, yeah, that is really helpful. That is really helpful. I am looking down because I'm looking at the questions that are coming from the room, uh, and I can see a load that are coming in. But I encourage everyone do keep um, using your devices. So I can see Ivan has asked a question that is, what do you think the people in this room can do on an individual level to support women in tech? I love the question, Ivan. I can't see you, but um, if you want, Ben's got my email. So if you want to go offline and talk lots more about that, we can definitely have that conversation. But here's what, the fact that you're asking is fabulous, right? We all need to be a part of this. We won't achieve it. We can't <laughs> achieve inclusion with segregation, right? So everyone has to, has to be a part of it. But here's what I recommend, right? Start with understanding. So understand the experience of diverse people, hang around with them, see what their life's like, share their stories, right? Let them share their stories with you. Then take a moment to think about your own biases. Why do I think the way I do make the choices I do? Where could that be coming from? Not for blame or anything, but just so you understand how it may influence your actions. Third, look at your points of control, right? What can you actually do to support the change in the short term and the longer term? What do you in your scope, Ivan's world, directly influence? And what might you indirectly influence? And then set yourself an action with a date and actually commit to it. So for example, it could be, I'm going to spend time mentoring X, Y, Z, you know, young female leaders or whatever your scope of control is allowing you to do. The thing is, we don't have to make grand gestures. We can just take one action at a time. I'm going to make an effort to understand more about, you know, what women's experience is. I'm going to make an effort to connect three women this month to people in my network that might help them. This is all going to contribute to help. Hopefully that answered your question. But like I said, we could take it off the line more as well. Now that's great. Um, so there's a question from G in the room that said, what advice would you give to a startup that has three white males as founders? And we see that quite a lot here in Future Worlds. I see it all the time. Don't worry, I turn up to, uh, I turn up to any meeting and I'm quite often the only female and certainly the only non-white female. So look, here's the thing. You're not just, I'm not saying hire people just because, right? But if you do go to hire, make sure you've got them on your slate, right? If you're looking at your advisory board, right? Make sure that you've got representation. And then as you create your products and solutions, while you're building out your company to be more diverse, as you start growing, at least make sure you've got representation in each area, customer advisory teams, you know, user advisory teams, user testing, all of those things, make sure you've got the representation that meets your audience needs. You can at least start there. And then when you start growing out your company, make sure that you take diverse hiring into account. Like I said, with your board, like when I was looking at our advisors, it was like, okay, like, let's make sure let's take the time, right? Even if I hire interns, I will make sure I take the time to have, to have her diverse slate and yeah. then hire who's best, but they've got to be on the slate to begin with, to have a fair chance. And you talk about diversity through the team. It's a strong point that Wendy Hall makes here that if if the team building the AI is not diverse, then the AI itself is not ethical because it's not bringing in that diversity of thought. Um, you mentioned well, we mentioned that you're an alumna of ECS, and there's a couple of questions that sort of relate to that. One is, what was it like being an ECS student here? And I can see at the back of the room uh, a man who was once a young postdoc who was supporting you in your GDP, who is now an illustrious professor in ECS, <laughs> standing in the room listening. So just be careful, Jonathan Hare is there. Um, but um, what was it like being a student here? And also, did your startup journey and the initial ideas start here, or was it after you you left and of course you're now in Silicon Valley uh, right in the epicenter there so a bit about ECS and a bit about where the journey started. 
full blown disclaimer, they did not pay me to say this. I loved my uni. You can ask anyone out here. I talk about uni all the time. I'm like, we had the best professors. They always had time for us. Um, and I was the annoying one, always asking questions, like trying to figure stuff out, trying to see what was on the exams and asking lots of questions, you know, like, and they always had time for us. And we were really blessed with the quality we had. And honestly, we did not have everything you have now. Like, had we had Future Worlds, that team that done that, uh, that project that he was just mentioning, we would have been up there every day with ideas. Hey, we've got this idea. We totally would have um, if we'd had it. But you know, has the, you made so many great connections with people and you'll find, I found, right, I, I'm still connected to a lot of this, the, the, my fellow students that I met at uni that have gone on to do all kinds of things. So keep your network alive. It's helped me a ton, right? Um, and we've all gone off to do great things like in different companies or whether it's for ourselves or whatever and, and just making sure you're nurturing that because you've always got each other's backs, right? Um, so take care of your relationships. Um, my startup journey did not start straight away. I went into, uh, well, first of all, after I finished my master's there, I was like, I'm going to go live in Spain for a bit. Um, so I, I, I left and went to Spain for a bit when the money ran out. Then I was like, I should go back to work now. <laughs> and I stayed in AI for a bit. I actually done medical imaging for a bit. Um, and then I realized that I love data and algorithms, but I don't like coding, but I love psychology and human behavior. And that took me to the world of experience design. And I ended up leading um, workplace experience for HP back in the day when it was like hundreds of thousands of employees. Um, and that took me out to California. And then uh, one thing led to another. Like, honestly, I can't lie out here. Everyone you bump into, you have conversations. Like, it's just the vibe. Um, and there came, I always knew I wanted to do my own thing at some point. But then the moment came where I was like, oh, it's a good time to go. I figured out that there's a problem and that there's a need. <laughs> So no, that's great. Um, and I can see Jonathan smiling for the support that he gave you at the time. So oh, you are question... brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. So there's a question from Tiffany in the room, which is this. What what is one tip that you would give to to a woman that's thinking of maybe founding a startup? First and foremost, um, just go talk to someone that you trust and respect about your idea and like like flesh out, take one action. But let me give you a second piece of advice for all the things that you're feeling or all the things about risk and everything, just come down from that and just take that one step forward. Just have a conversation with someone, flesh it out, do your market research, just keep focusing on one step forward. And second of all, never forget who you are. Honestly, like it's your values, your belief. That's what gets you through everything. Like I know who I am. I know my value system and that's what I'm measuring myself against. And I know my mission and I won't stop until I get there. So everything else, the rest of the noise, it doesn't matter to me. Right. And, and so just stay firm, like know who you are. And that's great. And um, so another question Ashley has asked, um, where can women founders go to get help and support other than future worlds? Obviously. <laughs> Well, definitely start with Future Worlds. Um, so there are so many networks. Honestly, I've lost count for women founders. Um, networks that meet, that do virtual meetings. I'm sure there's, I, I'm, I'm out here, um, but I'm sure that there's a ton over there as well. Uh, I'm sure Ben would happily help you find some. <laughs> um, but I can definitely figure out a couple for you as well. But there's so many where you can meet like-minded women and communities. And honestly, they're so supportive. And they'll be like, oh, I know so-and-so, I can connect you here. So it's all about just taking that step forward of talking and connecting. And don't limit yourself to, to women networks either. Like I can tell you out of, you know, the group of people that have really been my backers and my sponsors, um, you know, like 80% of them were men and that's okay, right? It's not about just only women. There's different, different reasons why you go to different groups and different kinds of support. Right. And so it's just about starting to tell your story, what you're going to achieve. And you'll see the connections start happening. People start going, oh, I know so and so, you should talk to them. And then that meeting. And then you go, you know, and it just starts like that. So, yes, there's women groups. And be clear in what type of support you're looking for. Is it that you're looking for connections? Are you looking for someone to say that, yeah, that idea's got legs? Right. Are you looking for mentorship? Or are you looking for the more like emotional support structure? So just kind of break down, like, what am I looking for to help me be successful? And then you can start narrowing down who you need to, to like connect to. That's Hopefully fantastic. I'm answering the questions. If I'm not, just tell no. me and I'll keep going. 
no, it's great. No, it's great. Um, so Heady in the room, I can see is asked really straightforward, really simple question, but a difficult answer maybe. How is it that you can be as confident as you are? Because I know my values. Honestly, it comes back to values. Like, here's the thing. I always ask, my, it's, a, it's a bit of a funny question for me, right? I work in the area of personal energy management. <laughs> so I've been training my brain for a while. And here's the thing. I always ask myself, like, is this serving my energy or not? Like, I'm not going to waste time with things that don't serve my energy because I have other things to do with that energy, which is my business, my family. Um, so it's two things, like understand what's serving your energy and what's not. But two, honestly, your values. Like, I only measure myself against my values and my mission. That's it. Like, if I live my day in my value system, what do I care about what anyone else has to say about it? Like, are they paying my bills? <laughs> you know, do they have to face themselves at the end of the day? No. So you know, it's about, I'm very, very conscious of where I put my energy. I will not just react to demands and I cut out a lot of noise because it's, when you really look at what people are spending their energy on, and obviously I spend a lot of time looking at this data, it's a lot of rubbish. And you can take that energy and put it somewhere else. But to do that, you really do have to learn about why do I make certain choices? Why do I not? And I've done that work, right? So that's really helpful. And that would feel like a natural segue. We couldn't have you on without you telling us a bit about Mevolution. Yeah. What's that all about? Oh, well, I didn't know I'd be doing that part. But basically what happened was we had, uh, my first company that I had was a data modeling company. We'd figured out a way to make very accurate data models for typically nebulous goals. And um, one of the things we set out to answer back in 2017 was what's needed to perform and feel your best throughout the day. And this data model, we have loads of data sources and we found these attributes. And as we started measuring it with people, the data kind of clustered up and delivered us this blueprint. Hey, there's this bunch of things that give people energy and capacity and there's this bunch of things that block them. And at that point, it wasn't even a business. It was like a responsibility. You were like, we have the opportunity for everybody to live life at full capacity. And that led us to what is now Mevolution. So it's essentially a way to measure what's depleting you and what's fooling you, uh, fueling you. It's called the energy management quotient. And then um, it's personal development modules that guide you through doing the work to live life very serenely, full of energy. You know, there's a reason that I'm just not a that stressed person, right? If you spoke to me 15 years ago, it would have been very different. That's great. Um, I can see Arabella in the room has asked, did you read any specific books that inspired you to create a startup? This is going to sound terrible and go against everything that you've ever heard, but I tend to not read a ton of books. There's a reason. There's a reason. Because to create the data models, I live in a lot of data sources, be that research papers. The last thing I want to do is pick up another book and read. But what I do do is I lean on my network. I talk to a lot of people. I make sure I surround myself with people that have either been there, been successful, can show me a different perspective. So I absorb information that way. If books work for you, then do books. If classes work for you, do classes. But for me, just like learning from people, that's the way I do it. Um, and I just, I, I made sure that I connected to a lot of really great people, not tons of people, just really great people that can help guide me in my journey. I don't always listen to them either because, you know, you have to, you have to process feedback, but <laughs> you've got to have access to hear it. Sarah, thank you so much. It's been a real privilege to have you join us from San Francisco live to just give us your insight, your perspective, and to answer all of those questions. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been absolutely great. A round of applause, please, everyone, for Sarah Dean. Uh, you're so sweet to have me. Thank you.